The announcements for today. First of all, welcome everyone. And if anyone here is a visitor, I would kindly ask them to sign the guest book in the narthex so uh, that we know who you are and can welcome you by name. The announcements in the bulletin today, the Ladies' Guild, the night's Ladies' Guild meeting will take place on November 21st. It will start at 1.30. And at 3 p.m., we have a guest speaker talking about cybersecurity services. So all are welcome to come to that um, guest speaker's um, announcements and get that good information. Um, I'd like to say it's Communion Sunday today, and anyone here who is a believer is welcome to come to the table. Our silent auction will begin in a few weeks, and donations to the auction may now be bought into the church Sundays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or Thursdays. And fill out the donation card, please, so that we have the information about your item. There are other announcements in here about uh, different crafts, uh, sales, and bazaars. Please take time to read that. And... Um, we are uh, looking for more readers um, for next year. If you're interesting, uh, interested in, <laughs> or interesting <laughs> um, in, <laughs> in uh, reading uh, the psalm or the scripture on a Sunday morning, um, then please uh, contact um, Elaine. All the information, Elaine Henley, the information's in the bulletin. And then also, if you would rather work behind the scenes, so to speak, and help in the kitchen, uh, then we're also looking for people uh, that can help us there. And uh, if you're interested in doing that, you would get in contact with me, and my information's also here. Uh, Simcoe Hall is holding a fundraiser for holiday planters, and uh, more information can be found in the nurse likes on the um, board. Uh, for the people that are part of the worship committee, the next meeting is this Thursday, uh, the 17th at 1pm. So please put that in your calendar and come. And um, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming out on this cold Sunday. And um, God bless you all. Our call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. We will lift up joyous song and sing our praises. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it rejoice. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord. For God will come to judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Let us join with all creation to praise the Lord. Let us worship God.
Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And yes, uh, you, I'm trying to get back on track now. You threw me off guard. And that's what happens. If, don't show me too much attention. <laughs> yeah. Another year wiser. Let's come together in prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks that we gather together this morning. Witnessing again, uh, seasons changing from week to week. Knowing, Lord, as a cold day comes, as a warm afternoon is on a way, or whether rain or snow come ahead, we know that it's you providing for us in all times, in all places, in all seasons. Lord, we give you thanks that you are the God who does provide. That we are so prone to wander. We have minds that will distract ourselves. There are things that will be placed between us and you, and it is we that put them there. That we set up our own stumbling blocks at times. That we do things and say things and act in ways that would make it understandable. For when we wander and we turn our backs on you, that you would wander that you would turn your back on us, but you do not. You are faithful. We give you thanks this morning, Lord, that you are a faithful God, that you are a loving God. That when we turn to you with hearts filled with repentance, asking you for forgiveness, it is there. We give you thanks, Lord. May we somehow be able to grow through it, and express it to those around us. May we understand your grace and mercy more each day as you continue to pour it on us. Hear us now, O Lord, as we pray the words Jesus taught us to pray together, saying, In Galatians, it says that love covers a multitude of sins, where if we do something to one another, we use love to cover over it, and forgiveness abounds, and mercy is great that way. But there is a forgiveness that is not mine to give, but has been given. And the forgiveness is already there, it's already taken place, the atonement has already happened. All I can do is just keep reminding you that you are forgiven, cherished, and loved. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
How old am I? Whoa, how old? We just turned 31, I believe. Yeah, all right. I'm 5 plus 0. And well, not, well, it's going to turn 31. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind sharing my age, because with age comes wisdom, and I'm getting wiser all the time. I will soon be 31. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, I whispered it. OK, ask the kids later. All right. <laughs> 41, that is correct. Not yet though, in a couple more days. Uh, how, was, how was Friday? Did you guys did you have a good um, doing anything different for Remembrance Day on Friday? Did your school have an assembly? Yeah. yeah. Big one. A big one, yeah. It's weird because probably last time the assemblies were just in your classrooms yeah. or something. And now chairs. Chairs in the assembly. Usually the kids sit on the floor they and the teachers it, get they chairs. They said it was important enough for us to bring our chairs down. No. Oh, you had to bring your own chair. No. Did you have chairs in your assembly? Yeah, yeah. It's lovely. Well, that's pretty nice. It's good to have those things to remember with. We're doing the remember thing that we do every month here at St. Luke's. We're going to have communion today. And I was curious. I want to turn back around to you and ask what communion is. Do you know? What do we do for communion? Um, it's like a remembrance of the Last Supper. Of the Last Supper, yeah. Jesus had his disciples with him, and he did something to help them remember and remind them. It reminds me of something. These two guys, now it's my turn to bear someone else. These two guys, they take piano lessons, you know, and their piano teacher, she's right here, and she has this saying. She tells them there's only certain days they have to practice. There's only certain days. Only days that you eat. Eat. If it's Halloween, it's days that you eat. Candy. Yeah. So on every day you eat, that's the, the same day you should practice piano. So Jesus also used something to remind us, because he, he used bread and he used wine at the time, and we used grape juice. And he used bread and wine. He says, when you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So every day you eat, remember me. So we do this once a month. There's some churches that do this every Sunday. Some churches do it three or four times a year. But we do it to remember what Christ did for us. And then there's more to it than that. We can remember that Christ is present with us, that he is for us and with us now. Um, but when we are going to have the bread and the juice later, it is a reminding us of what as well. So it's when you come to that time that you learn a little bit more about communion and you understand that Jesus was saying the bread 
and the wine symbolized his skin and the blood underneath his skin, saying it's going to be broken the same way his skin was, and then his body was, was put up on the cross, and the blood that would come out of it, he said, let that juice remind you of that too. He said, that's what he's doing for you. And that's part of the reminder that he wants us to, to have in our minds. So that's why we do communion every month. Some places do it more often, some less often. But that's why we do it. The more you know, right? <laughs> and someday if you take part in communion, we offer anyone who says, I want to keep following Jesus and I understand why we're doing this. That's all we ask for at St. Luke's. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for your gift to us. Thank you for your gift to us. Your sacrifice. Your sacrifice. In your name we pray. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The responsive psalm this morning is Psalm 46, and you can find it on the back of your bulletin. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake and the heart of the sea, though its waters roar. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. Let us pray. Almighty God, may you add your blessing to the reading of your word. May we hear it, may we receive it, may it push us into knowing, feeling, and exploring your love for us, Lord. May it open our minds to understand more and to do more. May you allow us, Lord, to be strengthened and fed by it. May you use the reading and the preaching of your word all to your glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
The first scripture reading this morning is from Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25, and it can be found on page 651 in your pew Bible. New heavens and a new earth. Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and of crying will be heard in it no more. Never again will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days, or an old man who does not live out his years. He who dies at a hundred will be thought a mere youth. He who fails to reach a hundred will be considered accursed. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree, so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither, do, neither harm nor destroy, on all my holy mountain. And the second reading is from Second, second Thessalonians, uh, chapter 3, verses 6 to 15. Warning against idleness. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model for you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy, they are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. And as for you, brothers, never tire of doing what is right. If anyone does not in obey our instruction in this letter, take special note of him. Do not associate with him in order that he may feel ashamed, yet do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. And the final reading is from Luke 21, verses 5 to 19, page 918 in your pew Bible. Signs of the end of the age. Some of the disciples were, remarked, were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witness to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. 
By standing firm, you will gain life. The word of God for the people of God. Today we're going to open to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 65, the latter half that we read. All of our readings point to something though, don't they? They talk about the end and how it's coming. Even that second Thessalonians part, don't be idle. Well, they were being idle because they thought the end's so close, we'll just cruise in now. We'll just pop it into neutral and coast in. But they were warned not to do that. But the prophet Isaiah, the second last chapter, we're looking at the second half of that. So we're nearing the end of, say, the Isaiah scrolls. There's a picture being painted for us. And as the verse 17 says, it's really handy too. And I have an NIV copy that I read quite often. You get the subheadings to let you know what you're about to read, if it's a parable or whichever. And this subheading is, does say new heavens and new earth. And sure enough, Isaiah describes at verse 17, new heavens and new earth that he sees coming. Last week, we talked about the Sadducees, how they were the certain portion of Judaism that that didn't believe in the resurrection of the body to come, that as we lay down uh, caskets and, and coffins and urns, we do so knowing the full promise of a bodily, physical resurrection, right? And we say, even our senses now as we know them, sight, taste, touch, hearing, they'll be back maybe more and even better as they were intended, a glorified state. We know that there's a body coming. We're not just destined to become floating spiritual things. That's the middle part. The end part says it's the resurrection of the body to come. Incorruptible bodies, imperishable bodies, bodies with no more back pain, (laughs) bodies that won't go through diseases anymore. Perfect bodies, experiencing God's creation in a perfect state. Sin will be no more. Evil is defeated. The final enemy, death, is cast into the lake of fire. And we're left with sinless perfection. And I've warned you before, try not to spend too much time thinking about it because you're going to fall short. (laughs) You'll try and picture it. You might think of something wonderful and beautiful, but it won't even begin to do it justice. It'll be that great. So Isaiah 65 is talking about such a place, it sounds like, doesn't it? It, It's talking about things being turned completely upside down, right? Things that we wouldn't even picture, not even occur to, like the animal kingdom. Oh, the, the wolf and the lamb are going to lie down together. That's the kind of peace we're heading toward. And he, and he paints it so well, and then it's almost repeated verbatim. Right? There's a little bit of plagiarism happening in, in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, this is how John is painting the picture talking about what's to come. In Revelation chapter uh, 21, it's talking about the new heavens and the new earth. And we can almost see how he's borrowing from Isaiah. We read this morning, Isaiah 65, verse 17, says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Revelation 21, verse 1 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Revelation will say this later in chapter 21 at verse 4. He, speaking of Jesus, will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Then we see where he was getting that from. Isaiah 65, verse 19, we read today. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and cry of distress. So John was not trying to replace what Isaiah wrote. He was was adding into it. He was filling in a little bit. He was affirming it and complimenting it and trying to give us a bit more insight into it. Isaiah tells of a time and place where everything we see as we know it will be different. He says that the lion won't even be a carnivore anymore. The lion's going to be eating straw. That would be very interesting, won't it? And all the other things. So that, that just gives you the idea of where it's heading. The, the animal kingdom, the hierarchy, uh, the, the killer be killed, eater be eaten. No, that's, it's, it's over with now. 
There's, there's this peace that now just goes beyond humankind. It's now over all creation. In that verse, talking about the, the, the wolf and, and the lamb laying down together, that's not new either. That verse sounds familiar, doesn't it? Where you expect to hear right after, and a child shall lead them. That's also in Isaiah. That's in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion, the yearling together, and a little child shall lead them. That's a prophecy that Isaiah has been putting all the way through. And that, that's the promise of the Old Testament, saying things are going to be renewed and restored and made better and made complete and made whole as, if, as they were once intended, like they were in the garden. But here's the tricky part. With all prophecy, with all prophecy, we have to be ready to understand how our minds work and how we can only fit so much in there at once and how we do have our preconceived notions. And it's most likely after prophecy is fulfilled, we say, oh, that's what that meant. There's one of those moments, and I've always went by it, I, I rarely bring it up, but it's one of those prophecies which held me up for a long time. It, it was in the Gospel of Matthew. I think it's either chapter 2 or chapter 3. I'd have to look it up again. But t- speaking of how the, the birth of Jesus, and Matthew says in his Gospel, thus fulfilling the, what the prophet said, he would be called a Nazarene. And people, there's, there's not many footnotes <laughs> There and it left a lot of people saying, where is that in the Old Testament? I can't find any prophet saying he's going to be a Nazarene. In fact, when, that, uh, when they talked about Jesus being born, the town of Nazareth wasn't established yet. There was no Nazareth. So, so how could the Old Testament prophet say he's going to be a Nazarene? But it's one of those, oh, is that what that meant moments where it's really incredible to think, mind you, I know Remember, I know this much Greek, and I know no Hebrew. So I have to go on what they tell me. But here's the amazing part. The word Nazareth comes from the root word for a branch coming out of a, a shoot, or out of a stump. And Jesus was prophesied, prophesied as being the, the branch, the shoot that's going to come out of the stump of Jesse. And it talks about it's going to be this uh, little piece that's going to grow at the side, and it's going to be how the tree is going to be regrown. And that word Nazareth, that's where that word comes from coming from a stump, the shoot coming out. So he is, here he is. The town that was named after the Old Testament had been finished written, saying he's going to be the shoot coming out of the stump. Well, here's the town that's named the shoot. And that's where Jesus is, Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, is that how that prophecy is fulfilled? Didn't even pick up on that being a prophecy. In that same way, we realize it's going to be a bumpy road, understanding prophecy. You have to be ready to be humbled quite often in coming to terms with it. First, we can't be adamant that Isaiah is speaking about the eternal state, the new heavens and the new earth. Prophecy blends the now and the not yet, a partial fulfillment, a later fulfillment, a taste of it now, more of it to come later. That happens in prophecy. We have to be willing to understand that because he does mention dying. So is this the eternal state where he talks about people uh, dying, or or as it mentions, is it a time of being richly blessed by God? For there's children being born, talks about never again will there be the tragedy of a child dying as as an infant, which does happen today, or or stillborn, or or anything like that. said nothing like that is going to happen anymore. So there's, there's children being born at this time, and remember what Jesus told the Sadducees, there's no more marriage. There's no more giving in marriage. There's, there's no having a marriage when, when in the resurrected body. So is this about the resurrection time? Maybe not. He said, as people pass, they're going to live a long age. If they die at 100, that's still being a youth. And they're going to live out their years. If you look at the book of Genesis, they have people living four, five, six hundred years to a long age. So... Dying is also part of this. So is he talking about this eternal state of the resurrected body to come and new heaven and new earth? That might be a tough one to say, well, probably not. I don't think that's what it was that he's getting at. But he's talking about something, a wonderful time, but not exactly the end end, not the last state. 
And for this, I will go back to the book of Revelation. And it's tough going to the book of Revelation when it talks about hills and horns and bulls and dragons. And it is all that type of symbolism. But we can understand something from it. Here's what the book of Revelation has, well, revealed to us some more. It's referred to as the millennium. And the millennium means a thousand years. It talks about this thousand years of being a reign of Christ. And how that's interpreted can really vary. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 20, and it's covered in the first five verses of chapter 20. And it does spell out for us what the symbolism is a little bit, because it talks about the, the dragon, the serpent, and tells us that is Satan, by the way. Revelation 20 says this, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil or Satan, bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the abyss, locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations any more until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be set free for a short time. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony about Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or its image, had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Revelation 20, 1 to 5, talks about a thousand years of those who died in Christ, reigning with Christ. Now, <laughs> now the millennium. As one preacher once put it, the millennium is the thousand years of peace that many Christians like to fight over. <laughs> How do we come to terms with it? Well, there's three main understandings. There's three biblical understandings. None of them are outside of orthodoxy. All of them are being faithful to the written scripture, just reading it differently. There's a plain reading that you can take. There's a reading of saying, we're reading Revelation. We have to be ready for symbols. We have to be ready for figures. We have to be ready for interpretations to come in. So there's different understandings. But as we're going to have communion today, we know as Christians that we are unified by one thing, not exactly how the ins and outs. It, you can take all the outline of what's going to happen at the end, and if you give a different timeline, if you rearrange some blocks, if you say, I think it's happening in this order, you're still in Christendom. You're still part of Christ's church. You can still pray with us together as we have our communion liturgy today, and there's three phrases, those three short phrases. Everyone can say, depending on how you view this millennium, you can say, Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. You can say that if you hold a different view on what is referred to as this millennium. But here I go, I'm going to try something that's probably foolish, so you're going to have to bear with me. I'm going to offer you the Cliff's Notes, the Reader's Digest. I, I'm the, this is the the abridged version of what books have been written on. But just to give you an idea, just to get you in that direction, to give you that feeling of how three main ways of looking at what is this millennium about then? What is Isaiah speaking about in 65? How do we read the book of Revelation? One way of reading it is called the premillennial reading, the premillennialist. The premillennialist understands a clear reading, a straightforward reading of the Bible saying that Christ came, he lived, he died, he was resurrected, he ascended, and as he did at the end of the Gospel of Matthew in 28, he said, therefore all authority has been given unto me, go therefore unto the nations and baptize and make disciples of all nations. And that's what the church was set out to do because that's what we're told to do. And the church will take hits and suffer and hold on and take a beating and, and, and it will keep going a little bit lower and a little bit lower but staying faithful all the way through until one point 
The earth, the, the, the heavens will open up and, a, and the loud trumpet will sound and Jesus will come down and he's going to bring all the living ones there and all the ones who have died in him and they will get a taste of things to come. They will live in this amazing blessed state reigning with Christ for 1,000 years as it says in Revelation. That's a premillennialist idea. You put pre in front of millennial meaning Christ comes before the millennial the thousand year reign that will take place. So now we're gonna change that prefix. There's another understanding. Take it pre and put in the word post. Someone who's post mill, a post millennialist, will understand it a little bit differently. They'll say the thousand year reign with Christ begins, uh, and it's not even a thousand years. It just means a thousand is a long time. But that reign of Christ began at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and, and empowered the disciples, and this is how they realized how they would carry out with Matthew 28 was going on when Christ said, go into all the nations, baptize, make disciples, all the power has been given to Christ, this is what happens, and they say, the church is going to then make inroads and grow, and go. they'll suffer through it, of course, there's gonna be suffering, but say, the church, the, the, the message of the gospel is gonna read the, reach the world over, and it's going to get a firm grasp on everything, and then we're gonna reach this blessed kind of era, this, this golden era where things are going to be so wonderful, almost like we, what we read in Isaiah 65 today. But then what we see, and, and I mentioned, I forgot to mention this part, as the day of Pentecost, around that time, that's when Satan was bound. He was bound to, as it says, the abyss, he was bound to the abyss to keep him from deceiving the nations. As it says, Satan is no longer allowed to deceive the nations. The nations can now receive the word of God, and Satan will not hinder it. It's going to go out to all the nations, and then he will be let out at the, just before the end. There's going to be a great falling away, and when we write about Psalm 46 at the back of your bulletin today, talking about how the mountains are going to be shaken, the seas are going to roar, there's going to be uh, tremendous things, but then peace will come, because that's when Christ puts an end to all of it, the last confrontation between this good and evil that's going to take place. So the, the post-millennialist will say, yes, there will be the falling away at the end, but until then, God's kingdom will continue to grow. So it's a little bit of a different outlook on things. But Jesus returns after the great time of peace, after the millennium has taken place. So that's a post-millennial view. Again, books are written on this. There's a third one. Take the suffix post out, and the prefix, sorry, put in just the letter A. So it's a millennial. When you put the letter A in front, that negates. So you have a theist and you have an atheist, right? So it's a kind of saying it's not there, but that's not even a fair way to say it. The third one, to be all millennial, is almost exactly like the post one, except it's saying that the time of peace at the end is not really going to be there. And also saying the reign of Christ, the millennial reign of Christ is really for those who die. If, if after the day of Pentecost, after Christ has sent out the Great Commission, and if you die between now and his return, you are reigning with him in the blessed state. You are with him in, in this in-between state, your body's in the ground, uh, to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord, and you are now reigning with him. And people ask, well, which one is the right one then? And I say, well, that's a great question. <laughs> I'm waiting to say, oh, is that what that means? I, I'm, I'm kind of saying they, they all have their strengths. They all have their weaknesses. And what I've said in two or three minutes, uh, there's been great debates by scholars and preachers, but it's all been done out of love. No one has kicked anyone out of the church over this misunderstanding. Our confessions don't allow for it. Remember, it's those three sentences. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. All three of those have that. How you block it out, a little bit different. How you understand it, each have their strengths and their weaknesses. There's people I look up to that can be completely on different sides and different territories coming towards this. But I'm still looking forward to that day where I can just say with confidence, oh, <laughs> that's what Revelation 20 means. That's what Isaiah 65 means. But all three approaches, pre, post, ah, millennial, they're biblical, for they all keep our eyes on the greatest prize. They all tell us that our only hope is in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. They only tell you that when it comes to facing evil, 
You have two choices. When it comes to dealing with the sin that's in front of you, you can either confront it yourself and fail or call on the name of the Lord and he will conquer it for you. They all back that. And it all begins all the way through from Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament on. This has been that same approach. This has been the gospel call. You can't, he can. You will fail and stumble and he will pick you back up. When that takes place, how that looks, we'll have to wait and see. Is it worth looking up these things and being aware of them? I would say so. Two weeks from now, we're going to be lighting our Advent candles and counting down till Christmas. We love to talk about that coming of Christ, the incarnation where the word became flesh. Why not put just a little bit of mind power to, to look forward to that day that he will come again? That... If it's, if it's going to be a little thousand-year reign, if it's going to be something spiritualized, if it's going to be just waiting and saying, come, Lord Jesus, until that day. I'm looking forward to it. And we can just do our one thing that we're called to do, not worry about being successful, not being worried if we're, if we're making enough inroads or enough ground, but just staying faithful to his word. Go, therefore, into all the nations, baptizing and making disciples. That's what we're looking toward. The same gospel call. To let people know that gospel. There's sin that you have in your life. You want to pay for it for yourself? Do you want to think you've come up with your own scales, your own way to put it aside and say, I've conquered the sin and fool yourself? Understand that there's only one way. The way, the truth, the life, the shed blood of Jesus Christ who covers our sins by a shed blood. Amen. And to God be the glory. This time we'll now uh, give thanks for tithes and offerings that have been given.
The same way he took the cup after summer and said, This is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Pray together the post communal prayer written in the liturgy. Let us pray. God of our God, our hope and our salvation, we thank you for this supper shared in the Holy Spirit with your Son.
And now as you go, may you receive this blessing. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.